Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Secure Insights with NDK Cyber. This week I'm joined by Harry Thomas. Uh, Harry is somebody who's been in the world of OT security for the last 10 years or so, probably before we were calling it OT security. Uh, started out on the red team side, moved more blue team and consultancy and advisory, uh, now with a, a company called Vertorio. Now, in this conversation, we bounce around a few different areas here uh, and we provide some real actionable points uh, on how to secure OT systems from a very sort of short term win perspective right through to your uh, longer term wins and goals as well. And that ever growing journey that uh, uh, that you'll be on in this environment. We talk about getting buy in. We talk about challenges you might face with budget, what you can do you know, with a more limited uh, scope as well. So really hope uh, you enjoy this one and uh, open to feedback as always. Harry, thank you very much for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for the invite. Not at all, not at all. So um, the the listeners would have heard a, a brief introduction from myself there, but in your own words, do you want to give us a brief overview of, of your background and what you tend to do on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, so I've been in OT cybersecurity for uh, just a little over a decade. Uh, I started in offensive cybersecurity, so like a penetration tester or an ethical hacker, red team, whatever flavor of uh, nomenclature you want to utilize. Uh, progressed my way through uh, to working with OT security vendors, startups. Um, worked at Security Matters, Dragos, uh, did a little stint at AWS Security, uh, where I fell in love with machine learning and AI. And then uh, now I work as an OT advisor at a Torio. Awesome. Okay, cool. So 10 years in OT security. So it's it, it's been in the limelight recently, as, as, as we've seen from uh, a lot of the media and things like that. But, t- but 10 years ago, OT security, correct me if I'm wrong, but where I'm standing, wasn't as much of a, a talking point. That's correct. Um, depending on who you talk to, there was a lot of people doing OT cybersecurity before it was even called OT security. Uh, but from my standpoint, when I joined into this industry, it was a lot different. We didn't have visibility of our assets. We didn't understand the reason why we needed to implement a defensible architecture. Uh, but nowadays, it seems to be, well, it is actually more of a talking point uh, amongst executives all the way down to engineers um, trying to figure out how to you know, secure the systems that give us running water and you know, flowing electricity. Yes, indeed, indeed. And is that partly due to the, to the breaches in the media, maybe Colonial Pipeline, I know gets brought up a lot, but other things as well, regulation, or just a growing awareness, maybe, I don't know. What's uh, what's your take on that? I think it was all of the above. Um, I believe that Colonial Pipeline really did, unfortunately, kind of light a fire underneath everybody. Um, Colonial Pipeline wasn't a direct attack on the industrial control systems itself. It was just a an ancillary attack um, that somehow, if I recall correctly, affected the business system that allowed Colonial Pipeline to bill uh, their customers. So inadvertently shut down the pipeline. But after that and growing ransomware, uh, we're looking at, I think Dragos put out a report a little bit ago, every quarter it's doubling or maybe even more, to be honest. Um, I believe by like, Mid Q2 of this year, it was already the same number of ransomware attacks as all of last year, according to to their reports, if I recall correctly. Um, no, um, uh, I read a lot, so. <laughs> but I, it's just um, there's that the in the United States, the White House put out a uh, a little bit of a briefing and such, and, and they put out their cybersecurity plan for 2024 to bolster critical infrastructure within the United States. You have regulations like NERC SIP, uh, even they're trying to figure out a way to help accelerate the adoption of cloud within electric utilities. So it's just a culmination of many factors that is somehow bringing you know, this to awareness. And then most recently there was the Iranian tax nation state attacks against um, PLCs, Program Logical Controllers, for anybody uh, who's unaware of what that acronym is. And, you know, that was water facilities on U.S. soil. So there's a lot of things going on. And then especially in Europe, too. I mean, there was a 
distributed uh, denial of service performed utilizing firewalls of the Denmark power grid. Um, so, I mean, you're just looking at before the attacks were so infrequent, right? They're so infrequent that you're like, why are we, you know, spending money on vendors, technologies, people, processes to keep the lights on if we're not seeing attacks that often? And I found that the organizations now that are most mature understood the impact of what an attack like that could do to their environment, to their network, or to the customers that they serve. Indeed, indeed. I, I heard somebody describe it as it's, it's, it's why do you wear a seatbelt in the car? You're going to wear a seatbelt. Exactly. You're not in a car crash every day. Not at all. Well, hopefully, anyway, touch wood. Um, but when you do, you I, want to there as a you know as, as a safety mechanism so I, I was going to ask you sort of around the in your view that the general state of ot security at the moment if you had to sort of summarize that and i know you touched on a few points there but i'm, I'm going to ask it anyway um you know what's the sort of the, the state of play in, in your point of view of, of ot security in the us let's start there yeah i'm finding so we're talking we spoke about the awareness right that it's now it's now starting to be, you know, operational technology, industrial control systems is moving its way towards a household acronym, mm -hmm. right? Everybody's talking about industrial cybersecurity. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even my family's talking about it and they're asking me questions. But if you're look looking at the state of OT cybersecurity, as far as uh, breaking it down within an organization, mm -hmm. uh, power utility, oil and gas uh, company, you know, midstream, upstream, I find that we're still fragmented. We're still siloed, right? So you have your OT cybersecurity personnel trying to ensure the network and assets are protected in the operational technology environment. You have your IT security personnel who are just told by their executive that they need to assist the OT security. Mm -hmm. You have your operational engineers, the people that manage and run the assets, like your relays, anything within power generation, they're responsible for making sure those assets are up and running and available. And then you have your executives mm -hmm. who have a different point of view of not necessarily how things should be ran, but what they're most concerned about, right? And you have these four separate silos and they're fragmented. They don't they're talking past each other. They're talking at least, but they're talking past each other. They're all saying kind of the same thing or having the same sentiment, right? We want to keep the lights up. We want to keep the water flowing. But without clear accountability, somebody needs to step up and say, you need to do this. You need to do that. And then there needs to be collaboration across the organization. Hmm. And so with that in mind, then, with, with all of this, this fragmentation, a, a lot of people talk about this having this problem. And, and we've seen that, you know, I've spoken to uh, to heads of IT security or CISO, and I, you know, there's a, maybe a role advertised. And they said, look, speak to the OT guys. That's nothing to do with me. Yeah, you know, and it's an OT security role. So so where does that come from? Is that like a cultural thing? Is that just inherent from, from the past where it's, we're the people in the office, you're the people on the plant floor, we... We'll talk to each other if we have to, maybe the Christmas party once a year, but outside of that, nah. where's that? Yeah, it definitely, yeah, it definitely has a little bit of a legacy mindset associated with, with it. You know, you have traditionally the IT professionals had nothing to do with anything in the plant. Mm. They're like, if you need a networking gear, like we'll purchase something for you, mm. right? We'll expense it, but yeah, and install it. But, you know, that's pretty much it. Um, and they always... Not always, but most of the time they purchase the gear that would just stay up and running and not necessarily uh, try to configure it pr appropriately, add virtual lands or or implement firewalls and firewall rules that protected the environment. Hmm. So what you're seeing right now is suddenly your executives, your CEO in particular, is probably getting pressured from the board of directors stating that, hey, what are you doing for OT cybersecurity? And now you're pressuring the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer. And they're asking 
their individuals within IT because that's the the normal group that they manage. Mm. And then now you're almost passing the buck a little bit, right? All the way down to somebody who's going to talk to somebody within either OT cybersecurity or somebody within the plants, right? Sometimes there isn't even an OT cybersecurity professional. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just the plant engineer, the process control engineer who knows a little bit about networking. They're the ones you're talking to. Um, But we need to find somebody who kind of owns all that risk. And depending on who you talk to, they might say, well, the VP of operations should own that risk, you know, the process control operations. And then other people are like, well, the chief information security officer should own the risk. Or you should have a VP of IT and a VP of OT cybersecurity. And the VP of OT cybersecurity should own the risk and, you know, boil it all up to the chief information security officer. Because to be honest, like when you're working with just information technology networks in, let's say a power utility, Hmm. that is half, maybe a quarter of the whole organization Mm -hmm. that you're managing. Mm -hmm. Albeit uh, the wild, wild west most of the time, as far as, you know, anybody can browse the internet for anything, but it's probably about a third or a quarter of the overall environment. But once you add the OT network to it, Mm -hmm. they might have less net, you know, less assets. But I find that the IT personnel who take over the OT cybersecurity duties are putting in double the work to try and not only understand process control, but understand how to secure these assets without taking down the network. Mm. Yeah, I think just touching on that, is that there, there definitely seems to be from who I've spoken to a real difference in that that cultural piece of you, you can't secure these things the same way. You, you can't, there's, a, there's no patch Tuesday. You know, it's not like that. If it comes down, it's, we might have three hours a year. We've got a chance to do all our upgrades and implementations. Yeah, we can't just do that like you can. So I guess what I'm asking here is if you've got these fragmented divisions, we've all got the same goal, surely. You know, a CEO, if a cyber breach happens, plant goes down for a weekend, millions lost. You can get insurance on that, but can you really? I don't really know. So, so where's the, I guess, where have you seen a successful fix for that fragmentation or breaking down the walls maybe, or the convergence, a lot of people call it, convergence between IT and OT. How, how do you sort of go about doing that or at least taking a step towards making everybody work together? Yeah, so let's let's take a step back. The IT, OT convergence, the, the point of that wasn't about personnel, it was about technology. That's already there. IT, OT, I mean, they're interacting, you know, all the time Mm -hmm. um, as far as the technology is concerned. But as far as the personnel, unsure. Where have I seen something like this successful or or what traits have I seen um, is when you have executive buy-in, particularly not just the board, but the CEO and everybody else, you know, C-level or VP level are bought into saying, yes, this is, this is something we need to do, right? This is an an initiative that we need to take in order to ensure that everything stays up and running. Much like in IT where, you know, you do your, um, your IT security awareness and they're like, cybersecurity is everybody, right? You know, everybody's responsible for this. It's this, I find it's the same thing with OT cybersecurity. Everybody's responsible. Um, but what it comes down to, I find is a lack of knowledge of what the other person has to deal with. Mm -hmm. So as me, as we'll say a network security professional, right. I'm in this organization and I don't understand you, the process engineer, maybe you're the power engineer, uh, power energy engineer, um, where you're like, well, I need to keep this. Emerson Delta V network up all the time. Mm -hmm. Like I can't do anything. And I'm coming to you saying, well, you know, you're asking for, let's say this firewall rule. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I don't know what it needs to do, but if you open it, it is bad for the organization. Well, now you're competing. You're not really understanding the reason why, because the engineer, power engineer was like, I just need it for Emerson Delta V environment. And the network engineer is like, well, I can't open this on the Palo Alto firewall. And you're like, 
speaking way past each other and not understanding that maybe Emerson needs to remote into their environment, into the process environment in order to perform maintenance updates, something along the lines of that. And it's just way more cost effective to do it remotely. Well, now me as a network engineer, am, I'm stopping that. And I might come to you a little bit later say, hey, uh, you know, the vulnerability team says you have a whole bunch of vulnerabilities in your Delta V environment. Mm. Process engineer might go, well, if you opened up that firewall, we would have gotten an update to the Emerson environment and that wouldn't have been there. Mm. So, so how do we get that to happen then? So, so if that's a problem that they're talking past each other, who's the sort of, I guess, the, for want of a better phrase, who, who's the parent in that situation that sort of splits up the guys and goes, right, stop fighting. You know, we need to work this through together. Is that where the exec buy-in piece comes in? I think the exec buy-in piece comes in as a final stop to any decision-making, right? Yeah. You go to the least of, you know, who manages who, find that final person, and that final person makes the decision. But the parent parent of the situation um, is generally the person that knows the most between industrial operations and cybersecurity, who can translate in each other's vernacular, mm. saying, hey, you know, this networking guy is saying X, Y, Z, and... Um, I just want to understand, you know, your side. I know you have to do this, but, you know, what's the reasoning for it? And then they tell you about the contract, service level agreements and all this. And you're like, oh, now I understand completely. And you can bring it back to the other side and say, hey, you know, the reason for this and justification is this. And, you know, we can maybe, maybe make it temporary. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't need to be, you know, permanent. So it's really the person, the parent is the person who understands both sides and can speak their language. Understood. Okay. And so, but there must be, you know, environments out there that, that haven't reached that like aha, aha moment yet of, oh, we need to do this. So is that like, do organizations in, in, in what you see, do they bring in outside help to do that? Is that somebody in the business that can typically fall into that role? Sometimes it's outside help. Um, sometimes they'll hire a consultant to come in and just kind of a third party is always nice to mm. level set with everybody. Like I, Aside from doing this work and making sure or trying to make sure that you guys are, you know, protected from a cybersecurity perspective, I have no, you know, uh, bet in this game. Um, but they have to train within. So if you look at, you know, we, we see or we say there's not enough cybersecurity personnel for the cybersecurity jobs we have. Sure. And that's a niche within overall IT. Now we hone that in a little bit more to OT cybersecurity, and we definitely don't have enough personnel. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the time, we don't even have enough new grad engineers to replace the engineers in electric utility that are about to retire in a few years. Sure. So there's just a shortage of these individuals that can take the place. So it's really hard to find somebody to come in and speak the language of both sides. Um, most of the time, if I have to say, you know, who takes over, it's probably like the network engineer or the network manager, maybe, who is interacting with both sides constantly um, just to keep the network up and available. And they're the ones that just through, I guess, osmosis starts to understand how uh, the OT side of the house operates. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Just from speaking from personal experience, it tends to be a lot of conversations we've had with those sorts of professionals. They tend to have been at the company a, a fairly long time, and I guess have that trust and buy-in and engagement from engineer through to, to exec leadership level. And, and just on that, we, we, we tend to speak to a lot of people that are in that position. They are titled the the network engineer or or, or similar on the OT side. And they they have a, a, a GX certification, which is, you know, GIC don't give out certifications willy-nilly to anybody. And so they're, they're clearly skilled enough in the security side. And you speak to them and you you have that conversation on the lines of, so who does your, your OT security? Oh, that's me. But you're also doing all these other jobs as well. So it's like a, another point added on the job description at the bottom. And you 
touching on what we've already spoken about a bit, but it's sort of, yeah, they, they, they didn't really have the budget for uh, somebody else. So they sort of gave it to me and that's just how it's been. Um, and that doesn't happen, I know, in the more mature environments. But in those that maybe are less regulated or have less of a budget for this, maybe, is that something you see as well? Yeah. So <clears throat> in the U.S., we have investor-owned utilities uh, like your Southern Company, Sempra Energy, uh, National Grid, all the way down to like your cooperatives, municipalities. What generally people forget about the budget is that the buck is passed to the customers. So if me as the head of this cooperative wants to purchase this new technology for a million dollars over the course of, you know, spread out over the course of four years, I then need to somehow create that in the budget, create that in, in my re revenue mm -hmm. by tacking on something or increasing rates for my customers. Um, and that's very difficult to, to really do. So that's why you hear a lot of people say, well, I just wear multiple hats and that's just what I do. Um, because that budget is sometimes not available and will not be available in the short term because it involves, you know, James, you increasing rates for your neighbor and you really like your neighbor. You guys go and have a barbecue, you know, in the summer, every other weekend, the moment you increase the rates, he's going to come to you and say, Hey James, what's up? Why is this happening? Yes, I say, I say. But then the risk there, I guess, is that if there is a cyber breach or a data breach, cyber attack, there's less resource to, to help prevent that or re respond to it in the first place. Yeah, it's a really chicken and the egg situation. You yeah. want to build an environment and defensible architecture, I keep saying that, mm. where you have enough resources in order to either identify the threat or stop the threat mm. and respond and recover. But that's really hard to do when you're trying to, when you just don't have the budget to do it. And I'm not saying that budget is necessary for just technology. Budget is necessary for investing the time into processes or people, mm. right? Being able to send maybe the person who's wearing multiple hats to a SANS training mm. so that they actually understand what they're doing rather than reading it through blog posts and going and attending webinars. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I guess just for that person that, that is listening now that may be in a similar situation or is the, is the one-man band, maybe they're called OT security, architect, manager, head of, something like that, but they're the only person, they're, they're not, they've got not, not got a huge amount of buy-in. Is there like a top list of things you would do to maybe assess the risk of their ot security environment from, from day one through to one to 90 days how to how to assess an ot security an ot environment for cyber security you've not got a whole bunch of buy-in you're the one ot security person there 90 days or, or the low-hanging fruit what, what, what would you tackle first to to get that secure uh environment yeah, certainly. So if you're the head or owning all of the OT cybersecurity risk mm. of your organization, I suggest you do a few things. Um, a lot of my suggestions will be corresponding to, you know, the fact that maybe you don't have enough budget to go out and get a consultant to do it or purchase a technology to assess your own risk. My first suggestion is building out a matrix, utilizing your favorite flight flavor of cybersecurity framework. The one I like the most is the NIST cybersecurity framework, just because it's applicable to almost all industries, if not all industries. So you have your identify, detect, protect, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Take a snapshot or understand all your security controls, or vendors, compensating controls that you have in place and put them inside your matrix and really identify where your gaps are. You might have stuff to protect. You might have firewalls in place, maybe firewalls in place and multiple levels where you're creating that segmentation. But if you don't have anything to detect a threat that gets by there, you know, that's a gap. 
afterwards, you want to be able to figure out your perimeter, the perimeter of the OT cybers, the OT network. So that perimeter are those firewalls. So if you have a lack of firewalls, AKA maybe you don't have enough, maybe you only have one firewall between the IT OT network. Well, you want to analyze those firewall rules, make sure that everything is the way it's supposed to be. There are some um, cost-effective solutions out there to do that if you don't want to you know, read firewall configurations. Okay. Um, and then you want to kind of build a plan, right? All right, so I have this one firewall and it's protecting, let's say, four networks. How do I then figure out a way to segment that? You can try to do uh, a proof of concept, a proof of value with a cybersecurity company vendor, um, maybe implement something to detect if that is more cost effective than implementing more firewalls. Um, but I suggest building this tier layer. You know, I keep going back to defensible architecture mm -hmm. where the goal is to stop, slow down, or detect the threat. The more layers you put, and then let me tell you as an ex, you know, red teamer, the more layers you put, the more um, frustrated I definitely get because I, it's hard for me to get to my goal because I'm flying in blind. Um, there's an old adage that I don't know if you've heard where the defenders always say, well, you know, the attacker only needs to get the answer right once. They only need to find one vulnerability or one password that works. But what they don't understand sometimes is once they're in the network, once the attacker is in the network, they have to be perfect. Okay. It's they can't they can't be making mistakes because if they make a mistake and they don't understand the entirety of your environment that you understand, it could be very easy to identify them and stop them and and contain them at least. So our goal as defenders is to make it as hard as possible. For them to go within the network because they're going to end up making a mistake and then we can capitalize on that understood so it's not like a uh, what you might see in the film sometimes the password's cracked and then you're into the whole system and you're just freely moving around you know it's there's layers to it yeah right you don't you're not um you know you're not a hack <laughs> i just activated spell check and then all of a sudden i own the whole <laughs> network it's not it's not that whatsoever um some some networks are like that some environments are uh, but you also kind of forget that like when you get a consulting engagement or when you do a risk analysis, unless it's a continuous risk analysis, unless it's a continuous engagement over and over again, it's all a spot in time. It's all right now. This is what it is. And your risk could change, you know, day after day, week after week. So unless you're continuously trying to identify this risk, um, Mind you, this is beyond the just, you know, identifying your security controls this is actually identifying a possible vendor or um, consulting firm to assist you with your journey. Um, but unless you're uh, working on that continuous risk assessment, it's really, really hard to understand kind of where, where you sit because you get a report and you're like, wow, this is a report. You know, this is all I need to do. I just need to do these uh, 56 things done. And you're like, no. That's not it. That's 56 things that we identified today. And it was a scoped down consulting engagement to only this one site and within this one site, within one network. So you've got to continuously do that. So th this might play into my next question, but I, I was hearing you talk then and defensible architecture is, is, is the end goal and we're always working towards. Outside in, it, it seems to be like a never ending journey, but in a good way, you know, it's not like a sort of a forever uphill battle, but it's continuous, it's evolving, it's developing as threats evolve and develop, I guess. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, so, all right. So just take in air quotes, recent release of AI, you know, chat GPT, uh, Google just released Gemini. Um, I think it was like in beta or maybe pre-beta, something along the lines of that. It's, I know it's not generally available because I tried looking for it. Technology changes so quickly. If we were doing this podcast a year ago, maybe two years ago, I'd say like, go out and identify these, you know, three technologies, implement them and you'll be fine. Yeah. But now, no, you have, you have AI that can be trained to help you create phishing emails, to help you write uh, a script 
that you can embed in an Excel file and have somebody double click on that. And all of a sudden you're on somebody's computer. So defensible architecture is ever growing. Yeah. And all we're trying to do and all I'm trying to do is boil it down. We're not trying to boil the ocean. And that's why I suggest that NIST cybersecurity framework where you can look at all your pillars and figure out, yes, this is what I can do um, to bolster my defenses and start heading towards that golden defensible architecture. But I know we're, it's, it's a journey, right? It's not, there's no just end. It's, it's going to be a journey. We've identified that in IT cybersecurity. We know that it's a journey in that it's going to be a journey in OT. Yeah, absolutely. So what might be golden today will be, be not so much tomorrow. And so on that journey towards defensible architecture, is there any like sort of common snags you tend to see people running into a lot along that, or maybe sort of things they can identify early on that will save them a lot of time, resource, money down the line? The number one thing, mm. all right, actually I have two things. I have two oh, things that um, uh, industrial organizations should work on. One is identifying your cyber, your cybersecurity strategy, okay. right? Not like what we need to implement right now, just like your overarching goal. You need to know where you're at and you need to know what you need to do to make that golden architecture, that golden site. But that's like a, it's like you build that strategy over the course of a year. You can get, you can get a consultant to come in and help you with the bare minimum and the bare bones. I mean, where it's like, all right, this is what you need to come up with. We can have these workshops, discuss this. And really understand like this one site, what can we do to make it better? And then we can replicate that across your other sites. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I suggest um, that is probably before creating that cybersecurity strategy is understanding your segmentation. Understanding your segmentation, understanding your external footprint, because there are sometimes like the water facility hack where the PLCs were just available on the internet. There's, you can use, you can utilize Shodan. Um, that's a, mm -hmm. a tool that you can just publicly search, you know, for PLCs. Um, you can search for like SSL or TLS certificates if it matches a certain organization name, so on and so forth. So you as the organization, it might take you some time to really, really understand how to do the Shodan queries, but you can also ask a consulting firm to do it for you. But you should really understand what is your attack surface on your outside as well. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say that gets breached. We need to create those layers because when we create those layers and all of a sudden they get to the process control layer or just before then, you know, attacker, I mean, and they can't do anything because it only allows outbound communication and I can't, send in a specially crafted packet to shut down your relay. All right, well, now I have to figure out what my maybe plan B or my plan C is as an attacker. Uh, so if you think about that in mind, you know, scenario-based type of risk analysis, scenario-based protection, um, identify your crown jewels, figure out your impact, and then how to compensate for that. You know, if it's going manual, going manual is a perfect compensating control. But in case of needing technologies, identify the technologies you need as a compensating control uh, in order to prevent such an impact. As early as possible, yeah. Which uh, I, I can see in some organizations from people we've spoken to of being, there's a lot of legacy tech. No one's really done this before. This is the first journey we're on. So it, it's, I know we've sort of given a high level overview here, but it won't be as simple as like a day's task to do that, obviously. Uh, it's much more involved than that. But I, th I think that gives some real actionable points on, okay, here's where you would start off the bare bones. This is what we need to get in place, first of all. And we've touched on it earlier on in this call a little bit, but with, with that program there, building that defensible architecture, it, who should ultimately own that? And that might vary depending on industry to industry or size or regulated or not, I don't know. But wh where have you seen success? Success isn't having a sole person own something. Right. There should be a sole person accountable for, let's say, the cybersecurity not being up to snuff or something along the lines of that. But one person accountable or, res or one person um, responsible for all of it won't 
won't work. You, you, it takes collaboration back to the beginning of the podcast, you know, we're talking about collaboration. You need input from everybody because you as the sole owner won't know everything. So you need to bring the relevant stakeholders together, understand what everybody's trying to say, mm. and then start creating your plan. And by the way, the plan, the strategy, it, although you can, like I said, get a consultant to shortcut and maybe give you the bare bones, it's going to take time. Mm. So as it takes time, you need to be doing your matrix. You need to be doing all, you know, your segmentation, all this other stuff, figuring out the budget for maybe next year or the year after. There's a lot of moving parts that needs to, that needs to be moving all together in parallel towards the goal, whatever the goal is. Um, but it's going to be um, a long journey. And it's going to be difficult in some days, uh, but it's just a necessary evil, I think. Indeed, indeed. And I think, you know, from, from outside in, you know, it's there's there's more light being shown on the space now. There's clearly more awareness growing that the vendors are catching on. And 10 years ago, we had no requirements from a recruitment standpoint for an OT security specific role. And, and as time has gone on, it's been cybersecurity engineer with some OT security would be fantastic. And then now we're seeing a big rise in ot security specific role so i think that's a really encouraging sign so you know over the next or two or three years i think hopefully though those snags you were talking about there and then the rough rides will become a little bit easier as there's more people and more budget and buy-in and, and all that good stuff yeah i like to think of ot cybersecurity like how i don't know maybe it security was 10 15 years ago yeah right or what IT security was when the cloud was first released. We yeah. had no idea what to do. <laughs> um, and we just, we're just evolving. We're developing our skill set as more types of training comes out. Um, you can uh, even free, free training, you know, or blog posts. I, I just suggest really try to dive deep and, and understand and ask questions of anybody in the OT cybersecurity community. I, I haven't met anybody in the OT community that would not either one, answer your question to the best of their ability or two, put you in contact with somebody who can help answer your question. I mean, even me, myself, I'll, I'll, I answer LinkedIn messages. I swear every night for like 20, 30 minutes. Good. No, I, I think that's a really valuable point to make because uh, I speak to a lot of people and that they have a LinkedIn account maybe, but they, especially since the COVID thing, since the whole you know physical networking wasn't as much of a thing anymore. I think people have become a lot more open to to doing exactly what you just said there, answering, helping and pointing in the right direction. I always encourage that. I think that's a, that's a massive uh, amount of knowledge to be shared just from that simple one line of message. You can connect with people. It, it's really easy to do. Um, and just out of interest, but where do you go for your sort of knowledge, if you like? My knowledge kind of branches out. So... I'm not saying I'm a end all be all. I know everything about OT cybersecurity. <laughs> I am um, the wealth of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm the wealth of knowledge. Uh, no, 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 no. There's many people, many people out there that know way more than I do. Um, but just like how cybersecurity is a makeup of three different pillars within IT, you have your system administration, you have your programming, and your networking. It's the same thing with OT cybersecurity. There's multiple facets that make up OT cybersecurity. And you have to know either a little bit in some of them or a lot of it in all of them. Um, but what I like to do is focus on bleeding edge of what I think is going to be introduced into the OT environment. So after Dragos, I went to AWS security hmm. because I had a feeling that somehow, some way cloud is gonna be introduced into OT. And not just that, but machine learning and AI. And then look what happened at the beginning of this year. Chat GPT, or end of last year, maybe? Chat GPT? Something along the lines of that. It's all um, about, yes. Yeah. It was, it was definitely fairly recently. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it was end of last year. But OpenEye came out with Chat GPT, you know, and, and all of a sudden, wow. Yeah. We have so much more we need to work with, identify. So... That's what I like to focus on. So right now I'm trying to focus on AI, machine learning, how it can either benefit OT cybersecurity 
or how to identify the threats that utilize those types of technologies mm. and how to best defend against that. Indeed, indeed. So with the AI and ML topic, it's it's on everybody's lips at the moment, like you say. And like you say, when then GPT came out, it was almost like a flip overnight and it went crazy. Um, so is that maybe a way to help address some of the, the skill shortage you talked about earlier with people coming through? Will, will that sort of help at all? Or will that just give AI to the bad guys as well? So now we've just got, we're at an even state again. Well, we're, we weren't at an even state before. You We have to... We have to notice that uh, and, and understand that cybersecurity, both in IT and OT, is a cat and mouse game. Mm-hmm. We're always trying to, as defenders, catch up and and you know be on the bleeding edge and understand everything. But unfortunately, sometimes vendors take a little bit of time to try to release these new techniques, try to release a detection for that technique or an, or an indicator of compromise. So we're responding and very reactive to a lot of threats out there. What I think AI can do, to be more specific, large language models um, or generative AI, is utilizing it as a way to compensate for maybe things you're unaware of or don't understand. So, uh, you know, maybe utilizing, and I'm not saying utilize ChatGPT and put your organization's data in there. But I'm saying maybe utilize ChatGPT and ask it questions of maybe the MITRE attack for ICS framework and try to understand that or the ICS cyber kill chain and try to understand that and really build that knowledge. And obviously you have to double check because it's a, it's a machine. So mm-hmm. we don't under, you know, we don't trust everything on the internet. So we shouldn't trust ChatGPT <laughs> just yeah. giving me information. <laughs> Obviously, ask somebody if you're like, that doesn't seem right uh, to understand the the whole picture. But I find that AI will help augment our productivity in cybersecurity, not just, you know, your admins and, and executives help build reports and such, but actually us boots on the ground needing to defend these networks, they will help us in productivity some sort of way. Yeah, I think so too. I think so. And uh, and going forward, we, we've jumped around on the podcast so far and, and thank you for fielding all the questions I've, I've thrown over. Yeah, um, no worries. But um, going forward, AI and ML aside, uh, anything you're looking forward to maybe over the next year or so? With the release of Gemini from Google that just happened, um, I, had, I had an answer for this and it was NVIDIA, um, but uh, with the release of Gemini and really looking at Google's answer, to open AI's chat GPT or GPT-4 or 4 Turbo. Um, I think AI is going to advance a lot more before we see the entirety of its benefits through adoption. So we know that there's a lot of companies, actually almost all companies out there are probably getting asked by their board of directors, what's your AI strategy, right? And some people are like, well, my AI strategy is to use chat GPT. And that's not always the answer. So as large language models themselves become smaller and smaller and um, easier to utilize on, let's say, consumer hardware, like your laptop or your phone, right? We're also going to see that in cybersecurity products and actually all our products out there that we utilize. I mean, as is like Salesforce has their own machine learning AI type. Uh, models available to you. HubSpot themselves, have they have um, an AI that helps you, you know, field, I think field emails or create emails and help you with tasks and such, and also helps create like marketing content for you. So, you know, you're looking at technology that can easily 2x your output, if not 10x. And me as somebody who likes to code um, on the side sometimes. Uh, and you always hear about, you know, the 10X engineer, you know, if if this technology can make me a 10X engineer, that would be awesome. Yeah, no, let's hope so, let's hope so. But I know what you mean. It's uh, every product tool or company out there, it, it's odd now if they don't have an AI element to what they do. 
I, I had a talk the other day and I thought, does this need AI? But apparently it does. Um, so <laughs> who knows? It must yeah. Be and we need to be also uh, mindful of, of these companies that talk about their AI and their technologies, because there's a big difference between utilizing like a large language model for generative AI and utilizing a machine learning model to help predict certain things on behalf. So uh, I think us as consumers uh, and business professionals, we need to start understanding that as well. It's really easy to inter intermingle them as you know you see it on like job postings, ML, AI, engineer, right? It's, you're like, oh, they're the same. They're not the same. Yeah, I think to be honest, I think that's a whole different podcast in itself. Right? Yep. Yeah, let's do that podcast later <laughs> on. <laughs> That and then uh, ultimately, we, we had a demo once for a tool that was uh, it was down as AI, but all it was was like an automation type piece. But we won't go into that now. We won't um, go into that now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Harry, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time here. I know you're a busy guy. Um, I'm, I, I took a lot of value from that. Hopefully, the listeners did too. And uh, we'll, we'll chuck a link to your um, to LinkedIn and everything below, um, so people know where to find you if they if they do want to reach out for networking and help and things like that. But uh, but thank you again, and uh, we'll speak soon. All right, thanks for having me. Have a good one.